Lecture 7.3, The Pressureless, Dusty Universe. So the next few lectures we'll be talking about different models of cosmological expansion and evolution. Uh, this is the f uh, simplest uh, model. And so um, in it, we're assuming that the universe contains mass, um, or in other words, dust. Uh, but that this uh, matter doesn't exert any kind of pressure, like a gas pressure or like radiation pressure. So that's, that's, that's the dust. It's not gas. It's like little particles that don't, um, don't exert pressure. So that's the term. What we're going to do is imagine that uh, we are looking at the large scales of the universe, so you know maybe billions of light years across, and that with time that the universe is going to expand. So initially we're at time t naught, that's the present epoch. Some later time it'll be t. At the current epoch, the density uh, rho. Uh, well, we can just simplify that as writing it as rho naught or rho of t naught. And the scale factor by definition is 1. Remember, the scale factor at the present epoch is always 1. Uh, in the future, we'll have some evolved value of the density and the scale factor. We're going to draw or trace out a, um, a sphere centered, say, on us. Um, it's going to have uh, some radius r at the current um, at the current time. As the universe expands, we're going to let that spherical surface expand with space, so it'll stretch out as space expands. So the co-moving coordinate eta is going to be the same in these two cases because again we're assuming that. This, uh, this sphere indicated by the red circle is expanding with space. So, so we'll have the same co-moving radius, eta, in both cases. The mass contained within the sphere of radius r uh, will be given by this expression. It's going to be 4 thirds pi r cubed times the density. And the mass contained in that expanded sphere will be the same. So it'll be 4 thirds pi r cubed times the density evaluated at the later time. But again, because the mass is just moving with this stretching of space, the total mass inside the sphere will must be the same. So that leads directly to our first law for the expansion of the universe called mass conservation. So we're saying that the mass inside that sphere, where we're evaluating the, the uh, coordinate distance r at the present epoch and the density at the present epoch, that that mass is going to be the same as the mass at a later time. We will substitute that, uh, remember that the coordinate distance r is equal to the scale factor times the co-moving coordinate eta. And we can do that at the present epoch and at the future epoch. So where we have an r cubed, we'll have a scale factor times eta cubed, uh, both at the current epoch and at the later time. Remember, again, scale factor is always equal to 1 at the present epoch. So this scale factor of t naught, that term right there, will be 1. So And then the etas will just cancel out. So we get that a cubed times rho, a cubed times rho, is just equal to rho naught. So that is the equation for mass conservation. Uh, we'll look at one more equation, energy conservation. To do that, we're going to imagine a thin shell of material right outside that sphere. So it'll have some mass m. It's going to be expanding outward with a stretching of space. So it'll have a 
radial velocity um, of v. So, oops, that should say v is that should say dr dt, not dv dt. The total energy of this uh, shell of material is going to be its kinetic energy, one half mv squared, uh, plus its potential gravitational energy. So minus gmm over r, where m is the mass inside the sphere, and little m is the mass of the shell itself. Um, there is no, the, the net force between the shell and all the matter outside of the shell turns out to be zero um, for an infinite medium. And we'll call the total energy just E naught where E naught is defined to be one half m k c squared eta squared. So we're not deriving this result. This result actually comes from a more complicated general relativity um, derivation. Uh, so we're just going to state it. So we have a minus one half, m is the mass of the shell, k is um, a parameter called the curvature of space. We've talked about that a little bit. C is the speed of light. And again, eta is the uh, co-moving coordinate. And again, we're just stating this. We're not deriving it. If we take this and plug it in, we see that this is the equation for energy conservation. So kinetic plus potential is the total energy. We're going to plug in for the, um, the mass of the sphere. So m is 4 thirds pi r cubed times rho. That goes in here. So that goes right in there. And if we simplify, we can uh, multiply through by 2, divide through by m. Uh, so we get just v squared by itself. Um, we get uh, this term, so this uh, r cubed cancels an r in the bottom, so you get an r squared. And then over on the right, the 1 half m cancels the 1 half m over there, so you get this. So we'll substitute v as uh, dr dt. And because r is equal to eta times the scale factor a, and eta is a constant, you can factor it out. So the velocity, you can write it as eta times dA dt. And we can write, again, r is equal to a times a, eta. So we'll make these two substitutions, plug them in to get this. So notice where we had the, um, the velocity over here, we now have an eta squared dA dt squared. And now where we had an r squared, we have a times eta. we simplify this, so we can cancel out the eta squared uh, to get this. And now we're going to um, factor out uh, a scale factor squared from the left-hand side. So we factor out an a squared uh, to write this term like this, 1 over a times t a d t, and then that a squared comes out of that second term. The we do this for a specific reason. This thing in parenthesis is um, is a quantity that we'll derive a little bit later on. So this equation um, is turns out that uh, you can derive that same equation from Einstein's field equations in general relativity, and you get the same equation. Uh, so this is called the Friedman equation. Friedman um, derive this equation from general relativity. We've basically been able to do the same thing just using uh, Newtonian physics for the most part. Okay, so what we want to do is solve this equation to find out um, how the scale factor of the universe changes over time. But before we do that, we want to um, define a few useful quantities. So we've already talked about the curvature parameter k. It measures the curvature space has units of uh, 1 over meter squared. 
we've seen that it affects the total energy of of our uh, of our shell here through this equation so the total energy is proportional to negative k so we've seen that when we have positive curvature you get like uh, you get a sphere when you have negative curvature you have a like a, a hyperbolic surface and when curvature equals zero you get a flat surface um, when the curvature is positive here you get a negative times a positive number so the energy must be negative when the curvature is negative the energy is positive and when the curvature is zero the energy is zero so just like in um, when we were talking about orbital mechanics when you have a negative total energy that corresponds to a bound system so in that case the universe might expand halt and then it's going to collapse back on itself when the energy is positive that would correspond to like a hyperbolic orbit in uh, orbital mechanics and that's that's a an open universe where the where the universe would just expand forever and when the energy is zero that would correspond to that critical um, point halfway in between or exactly on the border between closed and open so in celestial mechanics that would correspond to a parabolic orbit but um, in in curved spacetime that it that turns out to just be a flat universe where it just barely expands forever okay the second quantity to define is called the time dependent hubble parameter uh, remember that the hubble constant was defined um, as the parameter h naught in the hubble law v equals h naught times d in an evolving universe, the Hubble constant can change in time. So we call that time-dependent Hubble constant the Hubble parameter h of t. So we can write that the velocity of galaxies is equal to the Hubble parameter times their distances from us. We can write that uh, r is equal to the scale factor times eta. And um, note, at the present epoch, uh, we can write that h naught, what we called h naught before, like that 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec, that's just equal to the Hubble parameter evaluated at t naught at the present epoch. So we can, um, if we evaluate the velocity as just dr dt, remember r is equal to eta times a, eta is a constant, you can bring it out, so v is equal to eta dA dt, then we can show that the Hubble parameter is just 1 over the scale factor times the time derivative of the scale factor. And we see that by taking this value of v of t which is eta times dA dt, and just plugging it in right there. So if you take that, plug it in right there, uh, the eta's will cancel out, and you can solve for h in terms of the scale factor. This will come in handy later on. Okay, the next quantity is uh, that we want to define is called the critical density of the universe. So the critical density is the density of the universe that produces a flat universe with k equals zero, the curvature of zero. So we'll go back to the Friedman equation, uh, which is this. We'll plug in k equals zero here. Since this is zero, we can cancel the, the, uh, the a squared into the zero just to get this. And remember, the time-dependent Hubble value is uh, 1 over the scale factor times dA dt. So this term right there in the Friedman equation is just the Hubble parameter. So we can plug in just h for this quantity. So we have h squared minus 
8 thirds pi g rho. And then if you solve for rho, that, that rho will be now, the by definition, the critical density because it's the density that gives you a, um, a flat universe. So the critical density is 3 times the Hubble um, parameter squared over 8 pi g. So at the current epoch, the Hubble constant is roughly around 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So if you evaluate the critical density, it turns out to be 9.5 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms per cubic meter, which is not much. Uh, it works out to be about six hydrogen atoms for every cubic meter in space. And that's the average. That's the average. So that means that there's vast regions of the universe um, these voids out between galaxies that have way less matter even than that. The final parameter we want to define is called the density parameter, capital omega of T. So that parameter is uh, given by the density of the universe divided by the critical density needed to close or to make it a flat universe. And as usual, we could define the, um, the density parameter at the current epoch as omega at uh, t naught. At present, it seems that um, a lot of observations are pointing to this idea that the density parameter is very close to being 1, which means that we live in very looks like very, very close to being a, in a flat universe. Um, as we'll talk about later, um, matter in our universe comes in three different flavors. Uh, there's normal, so-called baryonic matter. Um, uh, but normal matter, that is matter made out of uh, atoms, uh, it turns out to be only about 5% of all of the matter in the universe. Most of the matter is in a form called dark energy, which it makes up 68% of the universe. And then there's dark matter, which makes up 27%. So, um, so it's interesting that, um, you know, if you add these numbers up, you get, you get, uh, you get something close to one, but that the vast majority of material that's in the universe, uh, we have no idea what is. We'll talk about dark matter and dark energy later on in the class, but for now they're just these, um, these things that we kind of infer from the cosmological equations, but uh, no one has identified what these forms of matter are. But uh, it looks like whatever they are, they're dominating uh, our universe that 95% of the universe is in a form that we don't understand what it is. Let's now go back and write the Friedman equation in dimensionless form. So what we're going to do is introduce these parameters. So uh, the density parameter is going to be the density over the critical density, the critical density being this, and then we're going to write the scale factor in terms of this Hubble parameter. So we're going to make, take these substitutions into the Friedman equation to get this. So you can see that 1 over a dA dt turns into that h squared. Uh, the rho here went into the omega. And you get that. Uh, from this equation, we can see that we can find a relationship between the curvature parameter k and the density omega. So let's look at this. So let's first assume that omega is greater than 1. So the density in the universe is greater than the critical density. So since omega is greater than 1, 
1 minus that is going to be a negative value. So the, the left-hand side is negative. The right-hand side is negative k. So, uh, so that means that k must be a positive number if omega is greater than 1. That corresponds to a closed universe, as we've seen. When omega is less than 1, then the left-hand side is positive. That means that the curvature parameter uh, k must be uh, negative. That corresponds to an open universe. And as we've already seen, when omega is equal to 1, k is equal to 1. That's a flat universe. So now we can label our different shapes of space by both the density parameter and the curvature. So really, um, the density of the universe is telling us about the curvature of, of the universe as a whole. And this fits in with, um, with John Wheeler's quote that matter tells space how to curve. So based on how much matter we have in the universe, what the density of the universe is, that sets what the curvature of space is on the largest scales. All right, so let's now look at uh, solving um, the Friedman equation for this case of the dusty pressureless universe. We're going we're to solve this um, for the case of a flat universe first. So the uh, curvature is zero, the um, density parameter is one, and um, and so we'll take these and plug them into the Friedman equation. So k will be zero. We're going to uh, rearrange this. So we'll bring this term here over onto the right hand side, multiply through by the a squared. In both cases, that a squared will cancel that one over a squared. So you just get d a d t squared is equal to this term times a squared. We're going to use the mass conservation equation that we derived, that the scale factor cubed times the density is equal to rho naught. We're going to use that to replace the density term right here. So we're going to say we're, we're going to write rho as rho naught over a cubed. So rho naught there over a cubed. The a squared cancels two of the a's on the bottom. So this Friedman equation simplifies to that. And we can take the square root of both sides and then use separation of variables to actually solve this equation. So um, we're going to move the a. We're going to take the square root of both sides first and then so we'd have dA over dt is something proportional to 1 over the square root of a. So when we move that square root of a over on the dA side, we get an integral of a to the 1 half power dA. Uh, and then you get this constant here times dt. When we integrate, we get 2 thirds a to the 3 halves is this constant times t. If we solve for a, we get that it's 3 halves to the 2 thirds power times this constant times t to the 2 thirds. This constant is something that we've actually already seen. Um, it's related to the Hubble time. So remember that the Hubble time is 1 over h naught. The critical density is uh, 3 h naught squared over 8 pi g. So we can solve for h naught, plug it in here to show that the Hubble time is equal to this. And notice that that 8 pi g rho over 3 it matches this right here, 8 pi g rho over 3. So uh, the final solution to the, the dusty pressureless universe for the zero curvature case is this. So it says that the scale factor is 3 halves to the 2 thirds power times time over a Hubble time to the 2 thirds power. So we get a pretty amazingly simple result, actually.
So there it is. This is what the solution looks like. When you take t to the 2 thirds, it looks like this function. Um, we can now solve for the age of the universe. Um, to do that, we say, remember, the current epoch is always when the scale factor is equal to 1. So if we set the scale factor equal to 1 here and then solve for t, that would give us what our current epoch is, t naught. So again, we set a equals 1, and then take everything to the 3 halves power, move stuff around. Uh, actually, when you take things to the 3 halves power, you just get 1 is equal to 3 halves times t over th. So when you solve for t, it's just going to be 2 thirds times th. So the age of the universe is two-thirds of the Hubble time, according to this model. So here we've drawn it in. So when the scale factor is one, you can draw a line across to our evolutionary curve and then draw it down. And we see that there's 0 0.5, 0 0.6, there's 0.7. So, you know, 0 0.666 is like right in there. Now, this is... Um, Kind of an interesting result because remember, based on the expansion rate of the Hubble of the uh, universe, the h naught constant, we found that the Hubble time was 14 billion years. Um, so the age of the universe, actually this should say t naught, not th. So the age of the universe t naught is just two thirds of that. 14 billion years, or only 9.3 billion years. So this model is telling us that the universe is only 9.3 billion years old, uh, which is kind of a problem because remember, in um, we've already seen spectra of galaxies that were 13 billion light years away. So there's no way that light could have gotten to us from a galaxy that's 13 billion light years away if, it, if the universe is only 9 billion years old. We've also seen stars and galaxies that are older than this. So this is a kind of an un, unhappy result. Um, we must be missing some physics because this doesn't make sense. This, this age for the universe is too young. So we're missing some physics, and so we're going to have to go back to the drawing board and look at more complicated models um, for modeling how the universe uh, evolves. But this is a good start. It gets us in the, in the ballpark. Uh, so that was the solution for um, a flat universe with zero curvature. Uh, here are the more general solutions. So if we look at an open universe with a negative curvature, um, the solution is in terms of hyperbolic cosines. Uh, with a closed universe, you get this uh, very similar looking solution in terms of arc, arc cosines. So, um, you know, more complicated looking things. Um, again, evidence points to the universe being very close to being flat. So these two solutions probably are not going to be any better at uh, predicting reality, we, we're going we're gonna to still need to go to another model that has more physics in it. Here's the solutions, though. So for the open universe, this is what that, hyperbo that inverse hyperbolic uh, cosine function looks like. Here's the flat universe that we already solved. And here's the closed universe that's in the arc cosine function. So. So again, you can see that the solution that we're getting for the closed universe, it'll expand, expand, it'll be slowing down, slowing down. Eventually, the, the expansion of the universe will stop, and it'll start collapsing back in on itself. Um, if the universe started from a Big Bang, then some people call this event right here a Big Crunch, where the universe smashes back together, and, uh, you know, the question is, well, would it rebound and make an infinite number of collapsing and rebounding universes, or would this just be the end of everything? Uh, nobody knows. 
Okay, so the physics that we're going to include is including pressure, whether that's due to radiation or um, due to relativistic particles.